development and future. Uh, my name is Donna Hamzy Krocha, and I co chair uh, this subcommittee with my co chair, Senator Christine Cohen, uh, who is with us today. And, um, and I'm not sure if she'd like to make some introductory remarks. Uh, she is juggling multiple meetings, successfully listening into all of them. Um, so I'll, I will turn it over for a second if you have just a few comments. Feel free. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Donna. Good to see everybody. I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion uh, from DPH today after uh, getting the overview last week from the EEP and just uh, looking forward to our committee work ahead. You know, having this basic foundation and groundwork will be extremely helpful uh, in completing our charge as a subcommittee uh, of the Greater uh, Commission. So happy to be here. And as, as Donna mentioned, mentioned, I'm uh, in a finance committee meeting as well. We have uh, about a month left in session here and uh, things are, you know, getting a little crazy. So I'm straddling both meetings. I am uh, present, listening uh, with, with both ears here and uh, look forward to the presentation today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Um, so as uh, my co-chair mentioned, last week's meeting, we heard from uh, DEEP on their um, <clears throat> role in sewer and water infrastructure in the state. And this week, we are lucky to have our um, agency DPH here to provide a similar presentation on their role um, in the sewer and water infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, without <clears throat> further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, Matthew Pollack from DPH who will be leading the presentation. And Matthew, feel free if you need to share your screen or introduce others um, that may be presenting with you. Um, thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just shared my screen. Can you folks see it? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna put it on uh, full view here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you said two other individuals, I believe my manager and my branch chief will be on, uh, Lori Matthews, uh, the manager, or the branch chief rather at DPH and uh, Jim Benoit is um, the manager of the environmental health section. So my name is Matthew Pollock. I work for DPH uh, in the environmental health section and specifically the environmental engineering program. So I've been in the program for about 20 years now, I'm working for state service for over 25. So definitely have uh, a lot of experience with on-site sewage disposal systems. So just have a brief agenda here. I just wanna go through today. I didn't uh, provide a lot of slides because I wanna leave more time for uh, discussion at the end. And I also um, didn't get too in depth with the technical aspect on this presentation. I think uh, definitely, um, Antonella hit all those points very well last week. So I don't need to repeat all of that. So just gonna go through quickly here, um, some of the topics that I'm gonna be hitting on today. I'm gonna talk about our particular program's responsibilities and our structure, um, our statutory and regulatory responsibilities, uh, methods of sewage disposal, uh, the operation of a conventional sewage disposal system, uh, the regulatory jurisdiction of sewage disposal systems, and then sort of a percentage breakdown of how the state is uh, divided up between on-site sewage disposal system and um, uh, city sewers. And then the role of local health departments. And last, I just had one slide, although we didn't really get into too much detail last week, but just about um, if an AT technology, alternative tech, the sewage technology is, uh, something to be considered to be given to uh, DPH. Uh, just some of my thoughts are on what some of the uh, pertinent points would be uh, that we would need uh, to move forward with just such a program. So first off, just gonna talk about our primary role. Obviously it's on-site sewage disposal systems. One document that we actually have it's called our technical standards document, sort of a, a cookbook design for on-site sewage disposal systems in Connecticut. Uh, it's somewhat unique. Um, it's a very technical document um, that includes pretty much everything you need to know uh, to be able to construct an on-site sewage disposal system in Connecticut. So we're the holders of that particular um, document. Uh, we make changes to that document uh, usually every two years or so. 
And uh, one of the things I like about that is we have uh, what we call a code advisory meeting, uh, or I'm sorry, a board, code advisory board committee, whereby we have um, all of our stakeholders are represented um, and they have some say into the changes that are made in this particular document. So those individuals include uh, our licensed installers. Those are the folks that are installing our sewage disposal systems. So they have a particular individual from their uh, organization. The organization is called uh, Connecticut Onsite uh, Wastewater Recycling Association. So they have an individual that comes to this meeting uh, that represents them. Uh, then we have our professional engineers. We have CIHA, which is the acronym for our, basically our sanitarians that work for the local health departments. Uh, then we have the directors of health. We actually have a representative from DEEP, um, also the Home Builders Association, uh, soil scientists, and even somebody from WPCA. So we try to include pretty much anybody that might have a say or an interest in um, you know, on-site sewage disposal systems in Connecticut. So I like the way that system works. And uh, just give you an idea about some of the things that are found in that document. So pretty much any of the components of a septic system, uh, as you can see some of the photos here, we've got septic tanks, um, leaching systems, piping, all of those products have to be individually approved by our office. So we have to go through those products and those things change. Uh, obviously there's technology involved here. So it's not something that, um, you know, you, you can put in there once and forget about it. it sometimes uh, changes are made, new products are in, some products are taken off and that kind of thing. So that, that's one element of uh, one of our job duties. Uh, we also provide a significant amount of technical assistance to local health departments in particular. Uh, we deal oftentimes with other state agencies. We work with DEEP, uh, DOT, uh, Department of Ed, uh, you name it. I mean, anybody that could possibly have a septic system, uh, any business that has a septic system, even st obviously state facilities have on-site septic systems, we even deal with those. So we're definitely interacting with a lot of different entities um, through our job duties. So just to uh, continue a little more, I'm just touching on the basic um, aspects. I mean, obviously there's more detail to what we do, but again, uh, also I should say technical assistance to our design engineers, our licensed installers. I'll get into our licensed installers later. Um, our department actually licensed septic installers and pumpers, and we call them cleaners. I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, folks later. Um, we also have exceptions that we issue that actually have to come to us specifically at the state level. Uh, just an example of one of those would be an offsite easement or uh, uh, what they call a well exception. So if you had a failing septic system on your property uh, and uh, the pre-existing property where you had a well, uh, and unfortunately the situation is where you cannot get a repair that's 75 feet from your well septic repair, uh, that specifically has to come to us. We have to look at those individually and make an assessment and then uh, give that back to the local health department. They move forward with um, the actual inspections and, and approvals and that kind of stuff. And again, I'm gonna get into more detail of, of the role of the local health department. And uh, just a nice segue to the next bullet item is we actually train the local health folks um, in uh, to be able to review and approve septic systems. We have a, a phase one and phase two training that we give them. Um, and so that gives them the, uh, the knowledge and ability to approve engineered plans and perform inspections and that kind of stuff. So uh, another item that our office does is complaint investigations. And as I said previously, since we do license the septic installers, if there's a complaint against one or cleaner for that matter, um, if there's a complaint against those individuals, uh, our office has to investigate that. So we have to determine whether or not that their actions were in conformance with the public health code. And lastly, uh, we also, uh, our office does register sanitarians, which are the local health officials. Um, so on occasion, if, if there's a complaint against one of them, uh, those individuals, we actually can take action and investigate that as well. And last, um, we actually specifically have to review certain engineered plans that have a design flow of greater than 2,000 gallons per day. So those plans specifically have to come to our office for review. So our program structure um, that's been this way for probably 30 plus years or more um, is we have three regional engineers, one of which is a program supervisor. Uh, we divide up the state 
And um, then we also have a, a, a fourth individual, an environmental analyst that um, handles uh, mostly the enforcement, a lot of the training, and then just is sort of a, a go-to person for um, some of the overflow that might happen in, in our regions. But um, I will say our office is kind of unique in that we have, uh, we spend a lot of time in the field. Uh, we like to be a one-on-one -on -one with, our, with our people, whether it's our engineers, our installers, or our local health officials. Uh, we find that when we're down to uh, the grassroots level, that uh, we're better able to make the changes in our code to know what's going on, what the issues are. So we definitely pride ourselves in uh, being very um, focused on in dealing with people right down at the at the level at which the, the work's being conducted. So uh, that's the way this program's operated for decades now, and it's it's been very effective. The only thing I can say at the moment is we lost our supervisor. Uh, through retirement this past October. So that position is currently vacant. And so we're down a staff person because of that. And um, so things are a little um, difficult at the moment, but um, we're certainly working back to get up to par where we are. But that's basically our structure is we divide it into regions. Uh, and then we um, have a supervisor that actually has one of the regions as well. So they, they don't, uh, that we don't have a supervisor that's separate from a region. <clears throat> So I'm not going to go through all of the particular read off the, the regulations. I mean, you can you can read the screen, but um, obviously, you know, there's your statutes that allow or give us the authority uh, to approve on site sewage disposal systems. Um, and of course, the specific public health code citations here. Um, so how this works essentially, and there'll be other slides later on, is it's really design flow. So uh, basically any property that has an on-site sewage disposal system with a design flow of less than 7,500 gallons per day, or, or 7,500 gallons per day or less rather, is going, to, is going to be under DPH jurisdiction. And so what that means is, is both our office and the local health department, anything greater than 7,500 gallons per day is gonna be DEEP. And that was Antonella's group um, last week that, that spoke. Now within that realm, there's also the alternative technology. So um, the alternative technology is something that's typically done or uh, jurisdictional wise is able to be um, approved at uh, deeps level. So that right now, as it stands, <clears throat> is not something that we um, are able to approve at this moment. And I'll get into what AT technology is in a minute, but I just want to make that distinction um, at this point. So just a little bit of overview here. So um, as far as sewage goes, we really have two big main choices. We have on-site sewage disposal, which is going to be our septic systems or public sewers. Obviously, um, you know, on-site septic systems are not appropriate for downtown Hartford and New Haven, and that's where you're going to be getting these public sewers. Um, and on-site septic systems are more associated with suburban or um, you know, rural areas. Um, so actually about one third uh, or um, uh, 1.5 million people uh, are served by on-site septic systems in Connecticut. And about 95% of those are regulated by DPH. So it's a significant portion. And then 60% of our state is served by um, public sewers. And rightfully so, obviously, as I said, you're not gonna have a, a septic system in downtown Hartford. It's just not appropriate and um, you just don't have the space for it. So what are alternative technologies? Well, if you, if you see my screen here on the upper right, it's gonna be an example of your conventional septic system. And I'm gonna have some slides to follow up here just so we can get a little more detail with it. But just the, the point to know here is when we talk about conventional septic system, we're talking about um, a, sim a simple system that basically um, is non-mechanical in nature. So we're dealing with a, a septic tank, which is a large structure that settles out the sewage and then followed by a leaching field that treats and then disperses the effluent back into the environment. So, and on occasion, we have to have a pump that actually pumps it to a leaching system. But for the most part, um, this operates without any mechanical uh, apparatus. And um, so there's no need for uh, a, a serious amount of maintenance. So the maximum amount of maintenance we're talking is basically pumping out the septic tank every three to five years. So there's not a lot of um, you know, mechanical devices that need to be operated and maintained. Um, so an alternative technology is going to be sort of a 
uh, I'll call it a little black box, if you will. And what it is, is it's installed within the treatment train of a conventional system, but it's a mechanical device essentially um, that further removes uh, typically just a nutrient, I'm going to say nitrogen from the wastewater stream um, that might not otherwise would have been removed in a conventional uh, sewage and a conventional septic system. So that's the, that's the short, uh, easy explanation to it. But, you know, as you might expect, being a mechanical device, there's going to be an operation and maintenance associated with it. Um, that's something that's not necessarily required for a typical a conventional septic system, other than, as, as I said, pumping the septic tank. So it's definitely a more complex situation. And at the moment, like I said, in the state of Connecticut, um, you don't see these being utilized on your average uh, you know, single family home or even, even most businesses and schools, unless they're under DEEP's jurisdiction, which typically means that they're going to have these design flows over 7,500 gallons per day. So it's usually a large slot shopping plaza or a school or something of that nature. So just to get you a little more idea, uh, again, to, with a, a conventional septic system, these slides show you that. In each one of the slides, you can see there's a septic tank and then there's a leach field. Now, I just want to stress the fact that some people have a misconception that these systems somehow are primitive and, and they're polluting of the environment and that kind of thing. And I'm going to say that that's not, that's not true. Um, if they're designed and installed correctly, these things are actually a very effective means of treating sewage. Um, now, in the past, that wasn't always the case. I mean, we've learned over the years, you know, 75, 80 years ago, uh, the idea was to, you know, to obviously, and rightfully so, was just to get the sewage away from our uh, exposure from people. So they would basically dig the deepest hole in the ground and discharge into it. And, and then we've learned that that's not necessarily good. It's good for keeping the exposure from people. And so people not getting disease. But unfortunately, that doesn't treat it because oftentimes if you put it really deep in the ground, you're going into a water table or into ledge rock, and that's the same water table that we're drawing our drinking water from, and then we're going to get pollution and people can get sick. So what we've learned now is that we design these leaching systems in a way that they don't do that. They're, they're installed above water tables, uh, distance from ledge rock. And um, so what happens is within these leaching systems, and these next slides are going to show you that a little more detail, you're, you're getting these bacteria, good bacteria colonies that are actually treating the sewage before it gets into the aquifers. And that's the idea. So, um, so anybody says that these are primitive, that's not necessarily the case. Um, they're very simple. Just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's uh, not effective. It, it's a very cost-effective means of getting rid of uh, sewage or treating sewage, I should say, uh, in rural and suburban areas. So just to expand a little more on what I'm talking about as far as uh, how we do things differently now and our understanding is better, is in these leaching systems, you're going to have these bacteria columns, or, uh, colonies rather, we're going to call them biomass. And the function of these bacteria colonies is actually just to eat the waste, essentially. And they're going to and deactivate these bad bugs, so to speak. We're talking pathogens and, and viruses and those kind of things. So this is what actually goes on inside of a leaching system. And within the first foot or two after it leaves these tr your leaching trench or field, whatever it is, that that sewage is very much renovated. Um, certainly, all of your pathogens and 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 things like that are all removed. A lot of your organic compounds are removed, and even many of the nutrients. Uh, there's some debate as to whether or not how much nitrogen is removed, and um, you know there's a lot of different studies out there. Uh, they're all based on modeling, not necessarily on empirical data. So um, the juries, in my mind, I still out in terms of uh, how effective these systems are for nitrogen removal. But either way, uh, for the most part, most of our uh, uh, bad things in the sewage are removed in these leaching systems. And so as you might expect, since, and I'm gonna give you guys a little interesting fun fact here. If you can look down at the uh, bottom corner here of that particular, you can see that's a, that's a leaching system. And, so what I've been discussing here is this so-called biomat formation. It's this bacteria colony and it forms on the outside of a trench. So, um, so the theory would be, well, if this bacteria colony is, um, is effective at removing the sewage, then more of it would be a good thing, right? So uh, in Connecticut, we're probably one of the only states in the country that actually credits 
are leaching products uh, for internal biomat formation. So, um, so that's why you see this structure down here. It has these zigzag uh, uh, sort of uh, ribs on it. And what that is, is, is the, the way this thing is designed is that the biomat forms on each one of those ribs. So there's more bacteria colonies actually treating the waste. And why I'm telling you this is because Connecticut uh, had this uh, credit rating, it fostered enough innovation that we had companies that got started in Connecticut that are not only national, but international, and some of them which are still based here in Connecticut. So uh, kudos to Connecticut for that, that, that we um, had to, or actually gave incentive for companies to create these products now that are used all over the world. So kind of a cool, fun fact. I just thought I'd mention that to you. Okay, jurisdiction. Um, again, this is pretty much stuff that we've already spoken about. Uh, the main thing to understand is DPH's jurisdiction is going to be when there's sewage design flows. Of course, again, we're talking when we have on-site septics, when there's sewage design flows that are less than 7,500 gallons per day. And that is in conjunction with our local health partners. And I'll get into that in a little more detail. There's the other second bulleted items, just a smaller item. We recently got... Um, what that is, it's water a treatment, wastewater systems. Essentially, if you have a water softener at your house and you have a backwashing system associated with it, uh, that backwashing system, that backwash water, rather, you don't want it going to your septic system. So we've recently gotten um, authority from DEEP to actually approve little separate systems for that. But that's a, a side note here. Just put that on um, our agenda just so you know that is an additional item that we deal with. <clears throat> and then obviously, Department of Environmental Protection, as we discussed last week, they actually, they have two um, methods of jurisdiction here. Obviously, they, they uh, actually administer the uh, wastewater treatment plant. So there's a section over deep that does that. And then, of course, uh, Antonella's group, they're the on-site folks. They're the people that are going to be dealing with uh, sewage design flows greater than 7,500 gallons per day and alternative technology. And then you can see that little definition there, community sewage disposal system. What that means is if I have... Um, five apartment buildings or five residential dwellings on a common sewage disposal system, that goes to deep as well. And that would be irrespective of the design flow. So even if the design flow was less than 7,500 gallons per day, if you had multiple apartment buildings on one common sewage disposal system, that would, that would have to be under deep's jurisdiction. So I wanted to mention that. So I'm going to um, get into great detail now about our local health department change. You'll see why in a moment, but our local health partners are um, again with us up to 7,500 gallons per day. So, oh, actually I'm gonna wait till the next slide. So here, um, this slide just illustrates for you uh, in, in, in uh, pie charts here of just on the right would be an example of what we were just discussing that about 60% of the state is covered by city sewers, 40% on-site septic systems. And then on the left-hand side is going to show you that of those 40% of on-site septic systems in Connecticut, about 95% of them are under DPH jurisdiction. Uh, and then 5% is under DEEP, and that, that DEEP would be Antonella's group, the on-site group. Okay, so getting back to local health departments, local health districts, um, why I keep uh, getting into them is they're, they're our, what I call our boots on the ground. They're the folks that are doing the day-to-day -day, uh, grind work as far as issuing permits. They're going out, they're doing the inspections. And um, they're, they're basically reviewing plans and everything else. They're, they're the ones that, and that hold all of the, the documentation of individual on-site septic systems within their files. Um, so uh, these folks definitely, need, or definitely uh, need the training from our office, and that's what we give them. Uh, we're our, they're troubleshooters. We're their go-to folks. When they have questions, um, they come to us. And usually there are in questions that are quite difficult and or situations that have gotten sort of uh, controversial or that kind of thing. So we do spend a lot of time um, sort of helping them through issues that they have. Uh, for the most part, though, 99% of the time they're self-sufficient. They're able to obviously conduct these operations totally on their own and um, you know, do the inspections and, and provide the, the public service that, that, uh, that they're supposed to be offering. So, um, but as this slide just goes to it, it's pretty much everything. I just want to make that clear. Um, 
you know, that there's, there's, there's four of us individuals at the state level, but the day-to-day -day stuff is done at, at the local level. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not involved. And again, part of the um, setup that we have, and I mentioned to you guys earlier that we're very close with our local health departments, oftentimes um, they, they like us to even have a regional office uh, where we'll spend some time there and work with them and, and um, you know, uh, they'll allow us to in between our appointments uh, to set up shop and, and, and conduct our business. And what's good about that is we, again, uh, by being right down in the trenches, so to speak, we can see what the issues are. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of unique. A lot of times there's a disconnect between state government and local government where, you know, the state government is, is so far removed. They don't, they don't really understand sometimes what's going on at that local level. And so again, our program is unique in that aspect that we're sort of right down there with them. So we know what's going on. Uh, they know they can count on us and it's been a really great relationship. It's, kind of challenging at the moment um, due to staffing and retirements, but that seems to be the theme going across every industry, whether it's state government or not. So um, this one last bull bulleted item, I just want to mention about the locals that they do. It's one of our regulations and this, and the reason why I'm mentioning it is because they do spend a lot of time on it. And this is just that if there are um, any activities that a homeowner proposes or a property owner that might affect their septic system um, that we have to evaluate the septic system. So just a quick example of that would be if somebody wants to add a bedroom to their house, um, that increases the, the sewage design flow. We wanna make sure that our septic system can handle that and that we have the ability to make a repair in the future that's compliant, that can, that can take that additional waste. Or if I was a restaurant owner and I wanted to add more seats, which means I wanna add more sewage design, um, I want to make sure that I have the ability to do that on our site. So um, that takes up a lot of time and sometimes can be contentious to property owners that want to do activities that literally have nothing to do with uh, sewage. And they get sometimes uh, upset about that. So they, they spend a lot of time on that. And that's why I just wanted to put that on the slide. So I'm going to be wrapping up shortly, but these are just some of the items that I felt it's very important uh, if the AT certification ever came under uh, DPH's uh, uh, jurisdiction and authority. And the main focus here is that with our conventional septic systems, the maintenance is relatively minimal. When we have these alternative treatment systems, the maintenance is much more intensive. And it's an absolute essential, an operation rather, it's essential that that gets done. And I'm going to go through these items, and that's what these uh, three key items are going to focus on is, and, and I will tell you this, that our office, um, or myself in particular, but all of us, we, we go to conferences, obviously, on occasion, and some of the feedback we hear from other states that have, you know, on-site or or widespread use of alternative technologies for, let's say, an individual home, um, they've done some research on their findings. And five years after, you know, they've installed these things in an area and they go back five years later and they test these things out and less than 50% of them are actually functioning. And so, you know, if you don't have the oversight um, and you're not, you know, looking uh, and making sure that these things are being either continued to be used or a operated appropriately. Uh, you're pretty much kidding yourself. So, you know, you want to set up where you have to have some oversight, and that would be something that that I would think that our office would be doing a DPH level in conjunction with our local health department partners, where we would actually have some oversight to make sure that these things, otherwise. Like I said, being a mechanical device, uh, people, they get tired of paying an electric bill or they, they, they don't want to pay a service technician to come out at 200 bucks a year. Uh, they say, you know what, I'm kind of tired of this. I'll just unplug this thing or I'll just stop using it. And so and that's that's why it's key uh, from from talking to many, many other states that you actually have to have an enforcement program associated with this. But with that said, the other couple items here is, is training. Um, you know, as it is now, as I said before, we we train our local health department staff. So we would actually have to train them specifically um, to, you know, understand how to review and approve alternative technologies. And because these are technologies, meaning that they're evolving constantly, a continuing education credit system is going to be essential. So so that's that's a whole nother uh, tier that you would have to consider. Uh, and also, 
um, you know, the installers of these technologies, the operators of these technologies, they would actually have to be licensed. So to be a separate licensing, as I said, our office, we, we license a septic installer, but that's conventional septic system. This is a whole nother level here. These are mechanical devices. These are uh, far more, um, you know, comp uh, comprehensive and, and, and um, you know, there's more to it uh, than, than your conventional system. So, and, and on the same note, these folks are going to also need continuing education credit because these technologies change. Now, there's an interesting thing here. I put this certification here because there's a couple states that I like their models. And what they did, and I thought this was a great idea, is uh, so the state would, so let's say you have uh, five uh, alternative technology manufacturers that want to come into the state of Connecticut that want to uh, use their product. So they would come in and we would uh, certify them. We would review the technology individually and say, okay, that's good. And what they're, and on their end, and this is, again, this is what other states do, and I kind of like this, um, is they certify uh, installers and operators themselves. So they do all that training and everything else to certify towards their specific product. So they'll have a roster then that we could cross-reference. So if we were... Um, you know, enforcing these and we were checking that these particular products are being operated appropriately, we can check that, yes, this individual is on that roster and um, that's been certified by the company. So that's kind of a, 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 a nice um, template I probably would, would consider using um, in the future if that came down our, our, our end. Now, enforcement comes into play, as I said before. The other thing and what other states will do is uh, how these things work, by the way. So again, just going back a little bit, alternative technology. So typically what they're, what they're going to do is they're going to remove a particular nutrient. So I think everybody seems to have concerns with nitrogen. I think that's where we would be going with this. And so we would say our target uh, uh, level of nitrogen removal would be 10 milligrams per liter, which is our drinking water standard. So these particular um, treatment systems would actually have to be monitored. So they would have to have a, a sample collected once, twice a year. And the performance of this particular unit would have to be monitored and looked at. And that's what the enforcement would come in. So, and other states, what they've done is if, if they find that um, the standards exceeded, they give them a warning. And then if it succeeded, whatever, two more times, they actually will uh, pull the certification from that manufacturer. So what that does, it makes sure that the manufacturer is on top of their operators who then will be on top of the property owners to get this stuff done because they don't want to get removed from the list. So I thought that was a great method of enforcement um, of this particular technology. And of course, with all of this, the last bulleted item is going to be, um, you're gonna need some kind of electronic uh, database management um, here. So something that you could do for statewide. I think our last presentation, people were asking, you know, that, I think that would be awesome if we were able to have, you know, every septic system mapped on, on, a, on an entire electronic database, um, which is entirely possible, but um, obviously it would take some time, but, but that would be part of this as well. So. Um, definitely just wanted to share some brief thoughts. I know probably a little more than brief, but, um, and I think that's it. Now, I don't know. I can go over this. Uh, my uh, branch chief is on here, Lori um, Matthew. Yeah, thank, thank you, Matt. Uh, excellent. An excellent presentation. I guess I'll pause there because I know it's already, you know, 33 after the hour. I know that um, what, what you had shared the last time is that you wanted to hear about drinking water as well. I put this slide together. There's a lot here. We could this could be its own presentation, but I'll sort of pause to to take your direction. Yeah, thank you, um, Matt and Lori. I appreciate this. this was very informative, Matt. So thank you so much, um, Lori. I guess I would say if 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 it's if it's worth having its own meeting, you know, I would I would lean on you for that. Maybe that's when maybe that's when we talk about um, drinking water because I do agree that. Is, is an issue of concern, one that I think maybe deserves its own meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps we you know, take questions now on Matt's presentation, and then if there is time left, we can sort of dig in a little bit and sort of a precursor to the next meeting, perhaps on drinking water, if folks agree. Mm -hmm. um, so I will open it up to questions uh, for Matthew on his presentation on the group. And um, you can use the raised hand function uh, on your reactions in the, the Zoom, or uh, you can just 
unmute and I will try and call on you or feel free to just ask your question. I see Nelson has one, so feel free, Nelson. Okay, let me get, I'll lower my hand. Um, a couple things. One is that um, uh, we uh, have done a fair amount of work with um, a concentration of septic systems on the Candlewood Peninsula uh, in Brookfield. That is, um, there's about 800 homes there uh, on the peninsula and another 1,400 homes right in the watershed area close to the, uh, the lake. <clears throat> and Candlewood's the biggest lake in Connecticut. And so what we did was um, we monitored the wells and the drinking water coming off of the uh, septic systems. And now th there's no uh, E. coli or pathogens there, certainly, but um, the uh, <clears throat> It is high in nitrates, and so it's it covers around eight to ten uh, milligrams per liter, which ends up being clear evidence of septic influence. And then um, it also we detected uh, boron, artificial sweeteners, PFAS, all in the drinking water uh, in the deep wells um, uh, coming from the septic system. So the contamination is more than trivial. I would say, um, and so uh, so that was from actual, not empirical work, but actually lab work that we did and, and studies in that area. And so they're all available online. Um, uh, and I'll, sh I'll share the link with the uh, leaders. And um, <clears throat> but it's um, and then and uh, so and in addition, we've also mapped all the septic systems in Brookfield. So they're all part of I can't remember the name of the website, but they're all put together so that they can be observed and uh, they're tracked as to how often they're pumped and everything is sort of on the website. So that's our town did that as a and there's maybe a handful of towns that have done it so far in Connecticut. But um, what we're finding is that uh, the other thing we're finding is that um, uh, the um, the lake itself um, suffers from um, uh, concentrations of phosphorus that happen, uh, particularly they, they run off during rain events. And so Deep was blaming, um, oh, people are fertilizing our lawns, but that's in fact not the case. And what's happening is that it appears to be coming from the septic systems and then in a rain event gets washed out and people are not using phosphorus on their lawns or, or nutrients. They just pump from the lake and the lake has enough nutrients in it that they don't need to put fertilizers on their lawn. So um, that's sort of an empirical evidence is the fact that there's so much nutrients coming from the septic systems in the lakes that particularly uh, they, it peaks during rain events. Um, and so normally soils are pretty good at uh, capturing the phosphorus, but it's not actually the case. And so we've had um, the down or the outfall of it has been that um, we've had to close the town beach right in that area, um, uh, maybe last time 10 or, 10 or so times a year because of, well, high e, e. coli is where they close it. But that's, again, clear evidence of, of uh, septic influence and then high nutrients uh, causing the um, uh, the E. coli to flourish. So those are my comments on the, the septic systems. Um, and yeah, can I can I address some of those? So yeah, sure. Um, yeah, actually, if Brookfield's my territory. I've I've been work. I know the sanitarians. I'm very well aware of Candlewood Lake and everything else. The only thing I will say is um, I would be careful with some of the assumptions that you're making. And again, as, particularly with nitrogen and E. coli bacteria, because E. coli bacteria, as you know, can come from goose droppings, can come from any um, gut of any animal. So it's tough again. And, and I'll tell you what, I mean, if it is sewage, it's sewage, we'll deal with it. But I just want just everyone to be, you know, just because you have E. coli doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's human E. coli. And then also nitrogen as well. Um, I, I don't know if I'd call it a smoking gun, 
um, in terms of whether or not that that, uh, you know, you found the nitrogen. I mean, people do fertilize their lawns. I've been on Candlewood Lake. I've seen it and uh, and stuff like that. But again, hey, if, if septics are creating a nitrogen problem, certainly, yes, we'll deal with it. But I just I just want to be cautious, uh, you know, when we see some of those things. But, you know, the PFAS, that's that's interesting to me. Um, that that's a very good that you know in our personal care products and things like that those definitely you know that's 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 interesting and that, the boron, that, that, the, artificial, that the boron the artificial sweeteners are down there and then exactly. it's not surprising that nit nitrates are high because mm -hmm. the same the septic influence at that at the deep level or you know I don't know a couple hundred feet deep at the wells but after 50 years it's uh you know the whole peninsula and it's it's rocky too so there could be pathways down, you know, sort sure. of shortcuts uh, down to the deep wells. And so anyway, maybe you ought to come <laughs> and visit me. So I'm, I'm a yeah. chair of the WPCA in Brookfield. Yeah, that That's would be great. Yeah, I, I know I've been, I, I'm down there uh, all the time that your your uh, main town hall and everything else. So maybe we can oh, get together. Knock Sullivan, he's big on, you know, well, okay, oh. we have this problem. And so yeah. we really need to uh, address it. So we have a program going to a million and a half dollar study right now to uh, what it would take to put sewers on the peninsula and um, and then uh, working with the state to uh, hopefully get some of the IIJA money to sp help sponsor the actual infrastructure work. Um, so, I mean, it's all in play right now, but there was clear evidence of septic influence and then the beach closures may or may not be septic influence. Uh, it could be, you could be right, but um, it just all is... Um, uh, maybe a smoking gun, but the lake is heavily contaminated. There's PFAS in the lake as a result of the septic. So, um, and he said, we reported that to the DPH, but I'm not sure it went to the right people. So. Sure. Thank you, Nelson. We do have a couple more questions um, from Bill Neely. Let's start with Bill. Yeah, this, this may be just in addition to what was said about Kenilwood, but the Yukon Clear, which uh, talks about the environment, has no... Uh, uh, noted that the embayments along the southeast coast of Connecticut in Long Island Sound um, have nitrogen, and it's probably the same debate: is it is it fertilizer or is it septic? But they have basically um, partially blamed septic. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. It's a Vaudry study that you're referring to. And again, I'm very familiar with that. It, a lot of those, unfortunately, again, they use modeling. And I mean, modeling is great, but it would be nice to have that data backed up with empirical data. And you're right, it's hard to separate out where that nitrogen is coming from. You know, is it lawn fertilizer? Is it stormwater? Is it septics? I mean, the only way to really do that is to actually monitor like right next to a septic area that we know is not being, you know, fertilized any we're in the proximity and that kind of thing. So I've been asking for that. There's a there's a newer study that just went on. It's called CDM Smith study. Same thing. It was modeling. Did a great job of this modeling. And but it, it, you know this stuff is more complex than people think. There's so many different factors that go into this because when you're dealing with soils, nothing's homogeneous all the time. There's all these different factors. And I, I just I'm a big advocate of empirical data. Again, I, I'm not saying that septics maybe are causing pollution, maybe they're not, but I really would like to have more data just so we can pinpoint our resources in the right direction. I mean, isn't that what it's all about is to make sure we're putting the money where it's most needed. So thank you for that comment. But we're finding nobody's arguing that if we put septics in the Kendall Peninsula, that the lake will deteriorate. Okay, um, so Brian Tunney, you're next. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. The uh, I, I've got a question for you. What has to be done to, to legalize advanced tr treatment systems? I mean, you, you, as you know, all many of the states bordering us actually enforce, make people use advanced septic treatment systems, especially near water courses, and they're required in Suffolk County, sure. which is on Long Island. Yes. And the, the, the why can't we do it? I mean, because there's empirical evidence that says, you know, the septics are failing. And, you know, okay. a, a, as well as, I mean, Connecticut has used septic systems as a zoning tool for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's a big issue. And the, 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 the thing is, is that, as you said, the, the, the states that are successful, they have a program 
which the manufacturer monitors the systems. It's the, in their best interest to monitor the systems and to, and to do the testing. So what has to happen? Yeah, so you mentioned Suffolk County. Yeah, actually, I like their model. I, I actually went to visit there um, and observed how they, how they run their operations. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is it's resources, okay? So in order to get a program set up to do this effectively, you're gonna, we're gonna need resources. And, and you saw, I showed you our program set up right now. I mean, we're bare bones. There's, there's you know, three, four individuals tops that are doing this for conventional septic systems. It's running quite well. If you want to do something more than that, you're going to need to have a, a basically a very much mirrored program similar to that. So, um, and that's that's the long and short of it. Um, it, it. It boils down to that. Can it happen? Yeah, just you, you're just going to have to have the resources dedicated to the right people to do it. Um, you're right. I, and I have nothing against uh, uh, setting up a program. It's just people way up above me, the policymakers, have to come to that decision. Um, but I'm, I understand what you're saying. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and it's multiple, multiple states. And, 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 and oh, how, yeah. how well, hard is it? To... Well, one of the last ones that, uh, that are in the whole country. You're, well, I agree. It, 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 it's virtual insanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's proven. And, and the fact that you put the onus on the manufacturer. Yeah, th there's ways to streamline how, how much work we have to put into it. Yeah, absolutely. I would implement anything that I could do to, to minimize the amount of staff needed to oversee. There's, you're still, you're still going to need some staff, but, um, but I'm with you. I mean, if we could implement things that are efficient, that could, could cut down on, on uh, staffing needs, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, and the nice thing about being the last one of the last states is we can learn from other states what went wrong. I mean, and clearly, you know, we've been taking notes on this. Believe me, we have. Uh, so we know where we need to put these resources. So we're not going to have to reinvent the wheel here. So again, you're preaching to the choir here. Um, there are folks way up above me that, at, that need to make those decisions um, and to come up with whether or not they wanna, they wanna put the funding in that area. But, but hey, we're ready, we know what, what has to be done. Okay, who is that? Who are the people that we have to, we have to talk to? Well, it's, it's probably gonna go way up to the level of uh, political. I think it's, it's beyond, it's, it's gonna be beyond um, even even state government, it's going to be above like uh, as, as senators or congress congressmen, congresswomen, that kind of thing, because they have to allocate the resources uh, to wh whichever department they they deem who they want this to be under. Whether it's going to stay with Department Environment uh, Department Environment and Energy or DPH. Okay, but but is it isn't Connecticut? My Laurie, I think you're on mute. Sorry to interrupt. But I think Laurie was trying. I, to... If I could step in, Matt. Thank you for that. You know, night, one of one of Matt's slides identified under Department of Public Health statutes, 19A, 35A. Yes. Um, and it's uh, for any alternative on-site treatment systems. Um, a capacity of 5,000 gallons or less, and it's within, you know, uh, avail available appropriations. That law has been on the books since 2007. Um, so that is something that um, is on the books and has yet to be, um, you know, funded. Though, why? I mean, it, it's clearly we've seen from the states that uh, that 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 require these types of advanced septic. I, I think that's, I don't think we're arguing with you. I think that you uh, you hear from Matt who, who gave you a great technical overview of how this could work. He's been studying this along with Bob Scully who has retired uh, along with, you know, Sean Merrigan and that makes up their program essentially right now as, as he's expressed it. Um, under the state law, we just haven't had the appropriation to be able to move this particular law forward. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're here is yeah, to talk sure. about, you know, I'm looking at Donna. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was just going to step we're in. Here to yeah. just, you know, at least put this out on the table about what we do today and not debate about how this could move forward. I don't think that's fair to Matt right. um, mm -hmm. and any one of us. But, you know, for, for Donna, if you want to step in yeah, on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lori, for that. Um, so, Brian, I appreciate your your questions and, and they're absolutely relevant to the work that our subcommittee is going to take on over the next couple of meetings, um, and you know we'll absolutely keep in mind. And if I could ask 
perhaps maybe from DPH's perspective, if we could quantify what those resources would might look like, if that's even data that you're able to collect to understand what that line item ask might be. Yeah, well, we'll we, we certainly can uh, work on that. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So Brian, do you have any other further questions? Yeah. Thank oh, you. I, I, Thank you. My understanding, it's just a matter of changing this uh, statute to allow it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> And thank you to Lori and Matt for, for fielding those questions. Uh, Thomas Armstrong, you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, again, uh, I'm on the uh, WPCA for the town of Avon and we're split. Uh, we do have uh, some sewers that we discharge to in Farmington and Simsbury, as well as a number of leach fields. Um, and I wanna say that we have a very good relationship with the Farmington Valley Health District. Uh, but if there's one thing uh, I'd like to see if we can improve better, it's our line of communications. Um, I think Avon's pretty sophisticated. We have uh, our streets identified as to which ones are likely to need uh, sewers, and we've got them all prioritized. Uh, before we go into, um, uh, usually we solicit from the public areas that they might like to be sewered uh, and the like. But where we could use better communication on the local level, and maybe this is software, uh, shared software, is uh, those that the local health districts where they report, um, I don't wanna say violations, but where they report sewer problems. Uh, because we have three pending uh, streets that are looking at sewers right now. We've gone out for a survey on those streets. And based on my participation in this group, I'm calling for, um, a meeting with the um, health district, the local health district, but we could use more coordination of the problems that the health district is seeing together with the problems that we see. We only see them on a small level. And I've got, um, I've got a number of other questions. You can come back to me, but I just want other people to get uh, their comments in as well. Too. Sure, you know you could you can get my I can give you my contact information. We can discuss this uh, on our own if you like. I, I'd be happy to do that with you. Great. And plus, could I could I ask how much have you reached out to the local? You represent the WPCA. Um, I, I'm a volunteer in the WPCA. I've been there for ten years. Uh, okay. Plus, so I'm as also a w an environmental attorney for thirty five oh, years. Okay. So as a WPCA member, you could locally reach out to your local health department and ask oh, them. Uh, to that's what I'm doing based on my participation okay. in, this, in this group. Excellent. Yes. Uh, but I think it's, it's probably a bigger picture. Maybe it's something that would help at the state level. It's the reason why I'm pointing out the issue. Um, uh, Cause I think it's important that uh, we know where they get reported failures. Um, okay. I know some towns are requiring mandatory pump outs every two and five years. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, our health district does not, to my knowledge. No, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, well, you mentioned and, there's a Carmody, it's called a Carmody database. I'm, I'm not a big uh, uh, technology guy, but I know there are databases out there that, yeah, as, as one of my line items for the other program, I mean, could be used for both. Um, in other words, a statewide database system, yes, that all the towns would enter in. So you're saying about failures and things like that. Yes, that could be entered into that data, um, that database rather, where you'd have all of the septic systems on all the properties in this one database, and you can have um, maybe a means of tracking failures, like you're saying, and that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Right. And I say this in part because anybody that served on a WPCA, it is tough. You're passing something. Our, right now, our sewer line extensions are running between 17000 to 23000 an owner benefit. Uh, and that does not include the connection from the house to the, to the line. And, you know, it's, a, it's tough. <laughs> uh, we're dealing people with all economic ages. Uh, and while I'm on this real fast, I'm a little bit concerned about um, Public Act 2129 and the sewer provisions in it. Um, and I don't have it in front of me right now, uh, but uh, we modified our sewer provisions uh, recently with regard to our connection charges so that we would charge a lower connection charge to uh, studio apartments, one bedroom, 
than we would to a three and four bedroom that we would to an over five. But under that act, there are a couple provisions that affect um, the ability of the town to charge for accessory apartments that are added uh, hmm. to the units. So I, there are a number of questions that, you know, I think are out there and I'm just trying to put out ideas, not necessarily to say that I favor one idea over another, but I find this group to be a very interesting group. Thank you, Thomas. And, and certainly the, your points are well taken. I think ones that we, again, will grapple with as we have um, further meetings of this group and to keep them in mind as we are having those conversations so that we can, we can work through them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm gonna move on to David Potts, unless you have another question quickly, we are running out of time. We have about five minutes left. I just wanna make sure everyone has enough time to ask their questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bob, just one quick second. I'm going to move on to David. If, if you're all set, Tom, this, okay. David, you're, you're nice up. to see you, Tom. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Um, I guess I work across the country with AT systems every day, and it's always important to understand what they are before you, you know, everybody jumps to conclusions. And really, there's no big difference between any of these technologies. Wastewater treatment comes from surface area and oxygen, or, or the ability to uh, get rid of oxygen. So when you have situations like was mentioned, I guess, at Lake, Canwood Lake, as Matt said, you have to be a little careful. One of the most important things is how many old septic systems are there? If they're sitting in groundwater, they will not treat well. We already know this it becomes very important to understand what you're building and how that treats. So a lot of systems now we test and we can see one foot under the system, six inches under the system, what the level of treatment is. So there's not really a debate as to how the systems we use in Connecticut work relative to AT. Um, sometimes the size of AT systems can be smaller and sometimes they remove a little bit more nitrogen. But that's really, I guess, the facts. It's surface area and oxygen. The other issue is we need to learn before we make mistakes. We need to learn from what people ahead of us have already learned worked or did not work. And as Matt said, there's a lot of lessons there. One of the really interesting lessons, and I think should be considered in light of uh, Candlewood Lake Nelson, is Lake Pocatah Park. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but there was a problem there. They sewered the entire lake. And guess what? It did not exactly go the way everybody thought. So it's very important that we we look at these lessons and we don't waste the money. And the, the resources are hard enough to find to begin with. And we make these moves, they need to be wise. We need to look at the, the latest science and things like stuff. The county is a great opportunity. It's nearby. We should see what they learn. And uh, I would say give them a little bit of time to, to learn as much as possible and come up the learning curve a little bit. So I, I think that's, that's generally, we're headed the right way and it's exciting to work with everybody here to maybe make some advancements. So thank you. Thank you, David, I agree with you. I'm hopeful that this group will have, um, will come to some of those uh, solutions together with our agency colleagues. Um, and Bob, I, I saw that you had your hand up. Um, would you like to ask a question? No, I'll be good. I'll be quick on this. That those who know me know that for the last 10 years, I've been studying and trying to get the gallons per day design standard reduced from 150 to probably around 100. That's an argumentative whether it should be different depending upon the the first bedroom, the second bedroom, the third bedroom. Uh, that's an issue that uh, Bob Scully brought up in, before he retired. But 150, in today's world, with all of the water saving devices, and even the cost of water is causing people to use less water, that the, uh, what we have designed at 150 is just crazy. It, what it does is it uses more land, something that we don't have any more of it's inefficient. Someone said the septic systems are being used for, as zoning tools. Well, one of the reasons why is the systems are too big. The other issue besides the gallons per day is the reserve area. We have not found anybody who has used the reserve area 
to repair or replace the septic system. Most systems, if they fail, very few of the current systems fail because they're installed properly and all the tests to put them in properly has been done. I've been in this business over, I was anyway, since the early 50s. And we know that at, at that time, many of the systems weren't even put in according to the standard. They weren't inspected. Uh, they were even put in by the homeowners themselves in many cases. Well, that's, not, that's impossible to, you can't do that. But the new systems really, really work. But the reserve area is a horrible waste of property. And I've been involved in my retired years in affordable housing. And I gotta tell you, you have a big impact on the ability to utilize land better. If you reduce that to a number that makes sense, the home builders are proposing 100 gallons per day, perhaps something that's uh, something for the first bedroom and then something less for the second, something less for the third and so forth. Bob Scully has claimed to have data on that and that we would like to work with the, the department to get that resolved. We have been talking about this now for close to 10 years and no progress has been made. And it's a simple, it's, it, it's regulatory, it is not legislative. It isn't gonna require any more people to be hired to do the job. Um, so we, we would like to have you look into that. Maybe the next time we meet, see if we can't get some kind of definitive answer as to when, if and when some changes will be made. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to say, Matthew. I, I don't want to cut you off. Well, well I, you know, in the interest of time, we yeah. certainly can take that back where Matt is well aware of, you know, the point that Bob is making there. And we can certainly, you know, write up a response or, or at least, you know, what we can work on together. So, Absolutely. you know, Thank as time changes, everything does change and we need to evolve. And to Matt's credit and his program with Bob Scully and Sean, the three of them, again, just the three of them, <laughs> along with Amanda, who does the training and education and enforcement, you know, they, they're a very effective and efficient team um, and changes can be made. So we're more than willing to work with everybody to think about what needs to change and evolve for the future. Thank you. Thank you to both Lori and Matt. It was very informative. Matt, thank you for your very informative presentation. I learned a tremendous amount actually just sitting through those slides. So I really appreciate it. And, and I, you know, I think this is part of this subcommittee's work and, and having our agencies here to provide that, um, that expertise, that perspective on what's possible and what may not be possible now, but we could foresee being possible as we do the work to get there. So I, um, in the interest of time, as Lori mentioned, I'm going to wrap this up unless um, I know I see my, my co-chair there if she has any closing remarks. And if not, no, no problem. I just um, want to thank you all for being a part of this, this meeting. And I'm sure we'll be in touch about uh, future meetings being scheduled. But um, thank you so much again to our speakers. And we'll see you uh, next meeting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.